Good evening all, and welcome. I'm not quite sure where we are, but I have no doubt that sooner or later we'll find our way. So get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. The most disturbing thing that's ever happened to me was on a long drive back to college for my last semester before graduation. I am a night person and was leaving kind of late for the drive, but was expecting to get in at around midnight, being that I would be living on my own after school. I was feeling a bit sentimental as it felt like I was leaving home for the last time. Home was somewhere else now. So it's sunset as I'm driving towards the highway and there's a beautiful low fog in the fields along the roads catching the light. I decide around then that it would be nice to try for a more scenic back road until the typical turnpike stuff. So I decided to cut off towards West Virginia. I stop at a diner, get gas, and then proceed towards the WV line as night falls. As it is the last human contact I will make for the rest of the drive. I didn't foresee it, but an immense, dense fog dropped over Appalachia that night, slowing my drive considerably. At some point in the mountains, there were scarcely 10 or 15 feet of visibility, but there are some small towns that the roads lead me through. It's Friday night though, and it begins to feel oddly dead in each town I pass through. It'd be 9 or 10pm, and the local bars would look closed. There were no lights on in any of the houses. It felt uneasy, but maybe that's just how it is there. Anyway, I'm making terribly slow progress with the fog, and the back roads at night. Deer sightings keep me on foot a little, when the fog wasn't so bad, but at some point, I'd have to noose my way through the foggy intersections, unsure if I'd find the other side. It was almost impassably dense at times, and the trip would take double the estimated time to arrive because of it. I'm often driving at around 25 miles per hour, or worse, trying to be safe. It's around 1 or 2 a.m. and there's no cell phone service as I get into a large national forest. There's no traffic around, so I decide to pull over to pee, leaving the engine on for whatever reason. It'd be a quick stop. I'm not fearless by any means, but I try to not let myself get too jumpy in the woods at night. But as I'm coming around the corner on doing my belt, I hear voices 40 or 50 yards into the forest, and then they're scrambling through the dead leaves and brush coming in my direction. It's pitch black, and I can't see anything off the road beyond the red glow of the taillights. Feeling sufficiently freaked out, and not willing to find out more, I bolt back to the driver's side and floor it to the next hill, happy I'd left the car on anyway. My heart is pounding, I never found out more about this little scare and I'm glad for that. A little while longer, and I'm heading up some steep mounting and nearing an old firewatch tower from World War II. There's a plaque about it being a community morale builder to have built it even if it didn't affect the war in any way. I pulled into the overlook to actually pee because I never got the chance earlier. Now that I'm atop a sizable mountain, I suddenly get good service, and a string of concerned texts from my mum, freaking out and asking if I made it okay. By this point I should have been at my house hours ago, but I took such a long and unfamiliar way in the dark and intense mist. Knowing that she wouldn't go to sleep until I'm there, I respond that I'm safely home, hoping that it will end it. She immediately calls me and asks me where I am, and I can't really ignore her call, having just messaged her. I tell her that I'm home and she asks, in Virginia? And I say, yeah, I'm in my college town, despite being at the top of a mountain in a forest in West Virginia. 
she sounds deeply unsettled, and said that she'd been trying to call me repeatedly, even though I had no service. I ask why, and she says that she got a really weird phone call from West Virginia, but way west of where you should have been, which is actually where I was. She said she got this phone call from a gruff young man with a backward sounding voice, who was telling her that he needed to speak with me, and swearing at her saying all these nasty things. She said she heard people in the background screaming, and people laughing. She hung up, and called me a few times, but it went straight to voicemail. She typed the number in on Google, and saw it was from West Virginia. I knew I was at least passing through a small part of it, and called the number back. A small child answered, and swore at her, and the earlier voices ripped the phone back and started saying my name again, and saying that he needed to speak with me. This was especially strange, because I was driving my dad's car, and I'm not registered to it, and even if they somewhere saw my plates and could run them, they'd get his name. I think I even paid with cash at the diner at the gas station on the way back, not to mention the fact that it was in another state. I can't think of anything I could have dropped with my name on it when I had stepped out of the car briefly earlier, during the recent incident. I still had all my cards on me and my ID. It would have been an incredibly strange coincidence, or extremely elaborate prank either way. I do my best to reassure my mum, and I have no idea what that could be about, and that it just must be a weird coincidence. I tell her I'm at my house and that I'm okay, despite how troubling I find all of this in reality. She gives me a half-hearted okay, and we say goodnight. I pull out of the watchtower, pull off, and continue on to Virginia. Never have I been so comforted by the 3am dregs of late night parties, students stumbling home at near university towns off a highway, I know well from my usual route. I carry on to that highway and make it safe easy, and things have been completely normal since, but I have never brought it up with my mum again, nor the heart to tell her where I was driving that night, or how late, or the voices in the woods. There's no climax and no resolution, I'm just trying to forget. I was running on the trails at the Nathan Hale homestead, an 18th century farmhouse and property of a Revolutionary War hero. This was in Connecticut, which is only about a 10 minute drive away from my grandmother's lake house. I could not find a map of the trails anywhere online, and there didn't seem to be any signage at this place just a bunch of random mountain bike trails in the woods. I was only going to run four miles, so I estimated that I would run for about 30 minutes, using my watch to keep myself on track. So I ran around the trails for a while, and nothing seemed too out of the ordinary. It was around nine on a Monday morning, and the only sounds were the distant hums of Route 31, birds chirping, and the occasional squirrel or deer that scampered off whenever I came near. The trail seemed to wind around a lot. If not for my better than average directional skills, I could have easily gotten lost. About 20 minutes in, I saw something strange about 50 meters off, a finely polished and light colored wooden coffin. I was a little weirded out to say the least, and waited until I got closer for a better look. I rounded a corner, where several old tree stumps blocked my view, only to find that the coffin had disappeared. Where it should have been, there was just a clump of ferns. Odd. I turned around shortly thereafter, and made my way back to my car. I was maybe half a mile out, when I heard a very distinctive knocking on a nearby tree. I was a little spooked, 
but chalked it up to be a woodpecker or something. However, not 30 seconds later, there it was, on a completely different tree ahead of me. Exactly the same rhythm. Talk, talk, to talk, talk. I picked up the pace. The trail widened a little, and I could see way ahead to the entrance to the parking lot where my car was. There it was again, on a tree seemingly right next to me. I truly started freaking out, and started to book it back to the lot. I was nearing the opening, when time seemed to slow down. All of a sudden, it felt like the temperature dropped about 20 degrees. The birds stopped singing, and my simple Timex watch started to malfunction, making all sorts of beeping noises, and the numbers glitching on the screen. The beat sounded impossibly loud this time, like it were hacked into every surrounding tree with an axe. An overwhelming sense of dread washed over me, as I anticipated hearing the rhythm again. I burst into the parking lot, and everything went back to normal. The temperature was back in the mid-70s, and birds were chirping away. I looked at my watch, only to discover that it had gone completely blank. I stood there, and stared at it until it flashed. 12 o'clock, Monday, 101, January 1st. My watch had completely reset itself. It had never done this before. I got into the car and started the engine. The clock on the radio read 12. That couldn't be right. It should have been around 9.30 or 9.45 at the latest. So I threw her in reverse and backed up to where I could clearly make out was the main road. However, as I was about to throw the car into drive as it sat there, I heard a sharp, rapping sound on the back window, like someone hitting it with their knuckles. It was the same beat. There was no one else in the parking lot when I finished my run. No cars, nothing. I didn't dare look back and hightailed it back to my grandmother's house. I have no idea what could have caused this series of events, and I still could not explain it to this day. I used to live way out in the middle of nowhere with my aunt and cousins for about five years. It can get pretty creepy at night. The town we were closest to only had a pre-K through. 12 grade school, post office, church, a tag agency and notary. We lived about six or seven miles away and we went to school there. Most of the homes are miles apart. We didn't even have bus stops. Each student was picked up from their house and parents whose children rode the bus had to pay a fee for gas because my bus rides lasted as long as three hours every day. That's how rural the area is, covered in woods and rivers, and there's a lot of wildlife. There had been a wildlife burning in a neighboring county for the past couple of days, destroying acres of forest, forcing wildlife to flee. We had been extra cautious when driving, because deer were everywhere and you couldn't drive long without seeing one. It wasn't uncommon to spot fellow motorists stranded after a deer incident. There was almost always blood spattered trucks sitting at gas stations. My cousin and I were going home. We were using her truck to help a friend move a pool table, and we ended up staying and playing pool until a little before four. We hadn't been drinking or anything, just hanging out and we were driving down this old dirt road. Over the trees and in the distance, we could see smoke from the burning wildfire against the night sky. A big buck ran out in front of us, causing my cousin to hit the brakes. Then something much bigger ran out after it and grabbed the deer. It happened so fast, my eyes were locked on the buck and I didn't get a good look at whatever it was. 
we hit the arse end of it, and whatever it was, went spinning. The truck crashed into a small ditch on the side of the road, sending dust everywhere. It wasn't serious and neither of us were hurt, but it knocked the battery cables loose. We pulled out our cell phones, but of course no signal, and we weren't surprised. Neither of us mentioned. We were hit, and we got out an attempt to open the hood, but we couldn't reach the front to unlock it, because the front of the truck was wedged against dirt and sitting angled downhill. There wasn't much we could do, so we walked up the road searching for a signal and using our phones as flashlights. Then we saw the deer laying beside the road. It had been gutted. There was a huge ragged hole on its belly, and its intestines were strung out for a few feet in the directions of the woods. This was a very large deer, and we immediately decided that we weren't going to be a part of this. We got back in the truck, and waited for a passing car. I rationalised that we must have hit the deer or something, but she knew we didn't. We hit something else. We got lucky and after about only 10 minutes, we see some headlights. It could take hours for another car to pass, but on these back roads, as soon as they get close, we flagged down the driver and told him what happened. He told us that he was heading out for an early morning hunting trip. He wasn't in a rush and offered to try and pull out our truck and followed us, showing a big dent he had from when he hit a deer a few days earlier, which started a conversation about all our wildlife animal refugees. We told him about the deer and asked him if he knew which kind of animal could do that and he decided to take a look. We walked him to where it was but it wasn't in the same place, and it wasn't a whole deer anymore. It had been ripped to shreds. Most of its bones were intact, with strips of flesh still attached. It was a horrifying sight, mangled and bent in odd and unsettling ways. He said, Holy shit, that's a 12 point buck. We asked if he thought a mountain lion could do that kind of damage in 10 minutes, and he just replied, maybe, very unconvincingly, and suggested giving us a ride home and coming back for the truck when it's light out. He gave us his number to help him pull the truck out later that day, but we had our uncles do it. We didn't want to bother him anymore. There was a bunch of black fur stuck to the grill but no blood. Our uncles brushed it off as an overreaction, but they never saw the deer. When I tell people this story, they're convinced it was a skinwalker. I live by a small river, and my friend and I always spoke about putting a boat on it one night, and just letting the current take us downstream whilst we fished all night. Well, a few years ago, we finally did it. We loaded up the boat with our fishing poles and a case of beer and headed out around 10pm. We put the boat in up the river, and my friend's girlfriend drove the truck home. The trip was only about 4 miles in a straight line, but throw in the curves of the river, and it was doubling back on itself. The actual trip was more like 15 miles. We'd been told it'd take about 6 hours, so we got to the river around midnight, and expected to be home before 7am. The river was really low that night, but we didn't expect it to be an issue, so we shoved off. The first few hours passed pretty normally, and we caught a few fish, but we passed a cutoff, and the river current just slowed to a halt. Around 2am, we hear this faint groaning noise off in the distance, we didn't think much of it at first, because we are both campers, and we're used to the forest noises. As we keep moving slowly down the river, the groaning noises keep happening, and it's getting louder. I can't even really accurately describe the noise itself. It was a very throaty, groan-slash-moaning sound, with a short duration. 
I say it was like a zombie noise, but it was very distinct, and at times it sounded like a man groaning in pain. For the next half hour, the noise got louder, until it felt like it was literally just out of sight on land, and it was loud. So I mentioned, the river was really low. Well at this point in our trip, the river walls were nearly vertical, and 10 feet high. The sound is at its loudest right now, but as we go down the river, it doesn't get any quieter. We aren't moving past the groaning. It's following us in the darkness of the forest. We're both getting weirded out about it, and we're both assholes, and we're amplifying the situation by coming up with all kinds of scary things that it could be. It's a zombie or a dying man trying to yell for help. A banshee? A ghost? Or could it be a serial killer messing with us? Maybe it's a siren trying to lure us off course. As it nears 3am, we're way behind schedule. To say I'm on edge is an understatement. I was trying to play it cool because my friend was playing it cool, and I didn't want him thinking that I'm a pussy. We're shining our flashlights into the forest, and we're watching as things scurry off in the darkness as the light hits it. The groaning is still going on. The loud groaning happens about once a minute, and something there is a quieter, slightly different sound that happens in between. The sound is finally behind us, but it wasn't getting much quieter. With the sound behind us, we figured we were in the clear, but we weren't so lucky. About five minutes later, we hit a log jam, and our only choice was to go ashore and carry the boat around the debris. There was one problem. We couldn't actually get out of the river. As mentioned, the river walls were ten foot high, and our only choice was to go back up the river a couple of hundred feet to a low spot and carry it all the way round. Now, I was really dreading about getting out of the river. It's dangerous enough walking down the river banks in the pitch blackness, and I didn't need a zombie banshee serial killer making it worse. So we turn the boat around, and head back towards the sound. We pull the boat out of the river, and the sound just stops. This is it. It is definitely a serial killer taunting us. And now that we're out of the water, he's moving in for the kill. There is no more acting manly and unafraid. My friend knows I'm freaked out, and I'm sure that he is too. The boat is usually kind of heavy, but tonight it feels lighter than ever. We're practically jogging that thing down the muddy banks. Everywhere we look, we see what is ducking behind a tree and staying out of the light from our flashlights. We finally get past the log jam. We're putting the boat back in the river, and whatever is following us is right behind us. I'm in the boat, and my friend is getting in. He pushes us off out the river, and runs around and yells into the darkness. What do you want? At this point, the Loch Ness monster steps into the light, and says, I need about tree footy. Okay, that part didn't happen. But we get back on the boat in the river, and the noise has suddenly stopped. But we're both ready to go home. We run the motor, until we get to a bridge. My friend calls his girlfriend, and gets her to come pick us up two hours early than expected. She asks why we cut the trip short, and he makes up some bullshit excuse about the river being too shallow and blocked up with debris, because neither of us wanted to admit that we were grown-ass men being scared of the dark. I never told anyone else I know about this, and I don't think he has, but we still mimic the sound every now and then, and any strange noise is instantly referred to as a zombie banshee. In the mid-90s, I went on a road trip with my son, and for some stupid reason, decided to take a different route home 
than the one I had previously taken and that I was familiar with. I turned out of the new route, and it was a super desolate road. I specifically chose to drive in the middle of the night, so that my son would be sleeping and so that there would be less traffic. It's about 3am, and of course my POS car system breaks down. By some luck of the draw, I am almost right in front of an abandoned roadside market, and was able to coast into the parking lot. The windows were all boarded up on the market, steam is pouring out from under my hood, and it was essentially the start of every single dumb chick breaks down in the middle of nowhere and gets hacked to death movie that you've ever seen. All of a sudden, I hear headlights coming around the bend. I'd been driving on this road for a couple of hours, and had seen maybe one or two vehicles the entire time. A truck drives past, slows down, and then I see the reverse lights come on in my rearview mirror. Deliverance banjo music starts playing in my head. The truck pulls up, so our vehicles are driver window to driver window, and I see that the driver is an older man, and he's just staring at me. He looks like the stereotypical killer that you visualize. Long, scraggly gray hair, grizzled stubble, crazy sort of eyes. He motions for me to roll down the window. I'm trying to look anywhere but directly at him, and acting like I didn't see him and that everything's fine and dandy. Oh no, I'm not in distress. Please ignore the steam coming from my car. I'm good, thank you. He backs up a little, parks, and gets out of his truck, and starts walking towards my car. I'm thinking this is where my son and I end up as news stories about bodies being found in the boonies when the snow melts and he starts yelling. I'm not gonna hurt you, roll down your window. I keep looking anywhere but at him, whilst trying to give off a strong, you don't wanna mess with me vibes, when in reality I'm shitting my pants. He gives me a disgusted look, walks to his truck, and starts digging around. He comes back with tools in his hands. And now I'm thinking, oh my god, he's got tools, he's going to kill me and bust my teeth out and cut my fingers off, so that I can't be identified. He yells, open the hood. I'm looking everywhere but at him. Open the hood. Let me see what's wrong. He's pissed. I'm scared shitless, but I reach down and pop the hood. He opens it and I crouch down so that I can see him through the couple of inches where the hood is open. He looks up, and we make eye contact, and I'm about to die. He looks down, and keeps doing what he's doing. He goes back and forth between his truck and my car a couple more times, bringing more tools, some jug of something, and other things that I can't make out. After about 15 minutes, he closes my hood and yells at me to start it up. My car sputters a little, turns over, and then seems fine. He yells, be careful, there are a lot of weirdos out there. Gets in his truck, and gives me one last disgusted look and drives off. My car made it home. My dad looked it over, and after I told him the story, he deducted that the guy had changed my radiator hose. My dad pointed out many times that the chances of being struck by lightning were probably better than my chances of some random guy in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night, happened to be driving around with a radiator hose, and the tools to replace it for a whatever 10 plus year old POS foreign car that I had been driving. I'm so glad that he wasn't a serial killer, and I never even said thank you. I have had the fortune of travelling all across this great and wonderful nation. But I've seen something whilst camping that makes me reconsider mountain folk in Georgia. Now, I love my home state. I love exploring the vast amounts of wilderness we have here. I just happen to carry a gun at all times whilst exploring now. I didn't then. I went to the Blue Ridge Mountains with a friend to hike. A week without cell phones, we called it. 
except we had his satellite phone, just in case of an emergency. We hike as far as we please, and fish, and we find water. Of course, we also have a GPS, and a compass to ensure that we don't get lost. So we're on our next to last day of hiking back. We come across a small clearing in a valley, that has a nice sized pond. We stop to set up camp and fish. As night falls, and our fire is fading, with our bellies full of fish, wild onion, potatoes and wine, we lay down to sleep. And then I hear it. My friend is fast asleep, and the sound doesn't wake him. There's something outside. Close by, but not distant enough. A moment of stupidity and adrenaline hits me, as I grab our machete, and exit the tent brandishing my lackluster weapon. The sound of that of a drum is being played with skill and expertise, that only a child with the basic idea of rhythm can possess. Upon exiting the tent, I see a fire and a woman across the pond. She's not creating the drum sound. Instead, she has a black kettle hoisted above her fire, and she's stirring it. She turns her face to me, and I see that she must be as old as the mountains themselves. Her clothes are nothing but rags, yet she has an aura about her, one that is dark, and filled with terrible wisdom and knowledge. Her ancient eyes meet mine, and I become paralysed by fear. The drumming grows louder, and then stops suddenly. And she's gone. So's the fire, and any evidence that she even existed. I started our fire again, and did not sleep. Upon hiking out of the woods and back into our car, we decided to stay at a hotel in a small town nearby, since I was exhausted from staying awake. Of course, I had told my tale to my friend when he woke, and we packed quickly, and moved as fast as our legs would carry us. We got to the hotel which, thankfully, had a restaurant and bar. I told my tale to some locals, and the consensus was that I had met the mountain witch, whose land I was trespassing on, and we were only alive because I had stayed awake. They may have been jesting, but they seemed very serious. I now carry a firearm whenever I hike. Mostly because it makes me feel safer. And whether you believe my tale or not, makes no difference to me, dear listener. But there are dark and ancient things in this world. Stay safe. When I was 19, my best friend and I, he's a guy, I'm a girl, road tripped around the coast for a few weeks of the summer. When we hit a Humboldt, we set up camp in a state park, then decided to cruise back to town to get some pizza, and see if we could spot anyone that looked like they would sell us some bud. After dinner, finding out no one was selling anything and feeling like dogs, we started driving back, and, on an exit ramp, spotted a woman with her thumb out. She was so nondescript, it was impossible to read her. Somewhere between the ages of 25 to 35. Straight brown hair, brown pants, and a plain blue sweater. Possibly because we were bummed out the afternoon was ending without any memorable pot-buying shenanigans, we picked her up. She said her name was Trish. She had these very hollow eyes, and she spoke very quietly. She carried a small brown leather suitcase. She asked where we were going. We told her, and we asked her where she was heading. She said, oh, I think I'll get a ride into the park with you. I won't sleep in your tent or anything, she assured us. We had had a two-person tent, and obviously didn't want a stranger in with us. We couldn't offer that. It was awkward. We had leftover pizza in the back seat, and told her to help herself. She ate it all quickly and quietly, like she hadn't eaten all day. 
we get to the campsite, awkward, and she asks what time we're leaving in the morning. So we tell her 10. She nods and says that she will see us then, turns and walks into the woods and disappears. We go to bed. No idea where she is or if she's coming back. In the morning, she appears minutes after we get up and start moving around, making oatmeal on the camp stove and she does not look like she spent her sleepless nights in the woods. She looks exactly the same, not a hair out of place, not even a pine needle stuck to her sweater. She observes our oatmeal, then disappears again, and returns shortly with two hands full of blackberries. This is a crowded campsite, and the blackberry bushes are picked clean. My friend and I spent a good half hour foraging the day before, and found three berries total. We put the berries in the oatmeal, and we all eat. We pack up, get in the car, and ask her where she wants to be dropped off. She tells us to take her back. Back to the very spot we picked her up. It's not the direction we're going, but it's not that far. She looks very sad, and she thanks us. She gets out, we wish her well, and she says something like, I doubt it. There was something spooky about the whole thing, but more than that, it was just really sad. I do wonder what happened to her. In the early 1980s, I was about eight years old, and my father decided to take me to deer camp for the first time. We were in far northern Wisconsin, where deer camp is sort of like a religion experience, especially our deer camp. Anyway, when we got there, my dad leaned in about three inches from my face and gave me a thinly veiled threat that he called a piece of advice. That what was done at camp stays at camp, and especially not to tell my mother what I was about to witness. It was mostly just a bunch of middle-aged drunks in long johns telling dirty jokes and playing cards. But to my eyes, it was the best place on earth. The first morning, my dad wakes me up early to go hunting with his best friend, who had cancer and wasn't expecting to make it back for next year. We were way back in the woods in a standoff when an unseasonal thunderstorm rolls in and chased us back to the truck. On our way back to camp, my father slams on the brakes because he sees something in the middle of the road. It was raining so hard that we couldn't tell what it was from inside. So my dad went to take a look. A couple of minutes later, he climbs back into the truck and simply says, she's dead. We raced for miles to the nearest phone to call the police. It turns out that she was heavily pregnant, had put her car in the ditch about five miles away, and had died from exposure when she became lost looking for help. My main memory of this though, is bursting out crying on the way home, because I just knew I couldn't keep this big of a secret from my mother. My dad simply told me that there were exceptions to every rule, and this was definitely one of them. My girlfriend and I were going on a backpacking trip in NorCal. She had worked that afternoon until five, so we didn't hit the back roads to the mountains off the highway until just before dark. The route we took was plenty familiar, and we went through a nice country area. This was our second trip to the same place, only the first time we came there happened to be during an OHV competition, so the place was really populated. This time, it was not, and my girlfriend joked about this movie where a serial killer cleaned out of town and just kind of played shop after killing everyone. Of course, then she falls asleep, leaving me and my dog awake. The whole drive through the town, and then the farmlands, went by without meeting a single person. When we finally started our descent of the unmaintained mountain access road, 
I get that nagging feeling that someone's there, and that you just can't see them. So I turn on the CB to hear any traffic nearby, from campers or night trail drivers and get nothing. Now this truck is 22 years old, and it has some issues now and then, but two hours into the mountain, the pitch black of the cab gets interrupted by a bright orange check engine light, which goes off a minute later. It's now dark enough that I turn on the overhead power lights to give myself more comfort of our surroundings. Just then, the CB squealed out the worst static ever, and I jumped to turn it off, looking back up at this big ass deer now standing in the road, as I had to slam on the brakes stalling the truck and bringing back the check engine light. Now it's dark, the truck's off, and the check engine light is on, and the damn dog starts whining. I try to key the engine whines, but no start. I sit there and wait a while, and hallelujah it worked. When we got to the trailhead, surprisingly we found around 10 cars parked, which is a lot more than comfort permits, especially so far out alone. And when I get out of the cab, I notice a group of eight sitting at an overlook. They turn to me, and one of them says, Glad you made it out all right. I later realized that at the vantage point, made it so that they were able to watch the whole three hour drive, all while I sat in that cab feeling so damn alone. Sure helps you remember there's always someone who's watching, even if you think you're alone. I am a hunter and mountaineer. It was a chilly December morning, and I hiked in pre-dawn. I'm talking about an hour and a half to go three miles off the beaten trail. I got to my nest, and about half an hour before sunrise, and started to settle in. The wind kicked up a fog, and the fog rolled in that was thicker than a bowl of oatmeal. Within a few minutes, my visibility was about five inches. I'm sitting tight, huddled up against the freezing wind, when I start to hear twigs snapping close to me. For no apparent reason, what is normally a rapturous sound, indicative of an imminently successful hunt, sent a frosty chill down my spine. I chambered around in my 30-30 as quietly as I could, and lay flat on my back, tucked against a fallen tree. The rustling was moving closer through the fog, but I couldn't see anything. The sun was starting to peek over the mountains to the east, and visibility was starting to increase. The rustling of twigs and leaves was sporadic, sometimes directly in front of me, sometimes behind or besides me. I remember laying the rifle across my chest, thinking to myself how silly it is to react like such a coward. I rationed with myself that bears and mountain lions are a rarity where I was, so I had likely stumbled into a herd of whitetails that had bedded down and decided to sit up. The rustling stopped immediately, as it was fully dawn by now. I was looking through the fog for the outline of my prey, which I had assured myself was literally around me. It wasn't. Seemingly nothing was. By now the fog had faded away, and it was apparent to me that I was alone in those woods. I hunted all that day, without seeing as much as a squirrel. Around three in the afternoon, after fighting the wind in an abnormally cold day, and not wanting to hike out by flashlight, I decided it was time to start back to the truck. Walking out of those woods was the most uneasy I had ever felt. Lawfully, once you make your way back to the trail, you're supposed to clear the chamber of your rifle, but not that day. What is normally a stroll through the woods, I undertook with the seriousness of an animal being stalked. I would walk, then stop and listen and I never heard or saw anything during my retreat, but I could feel eyes on me. 
I was about a hundred feet away from my truck when I rounded the last corner and saw, hanging at eye level from a tree by a noose, a stuffed bear in a blazed orange jacket. I am a giant, broad-shouldered outdoorsman, but that one shook me up something fierce. Once, my friends and I were driving back from the nearest decent-sized city to our crappy little hometown in rural Tennessee. Now, I had an old car, but it was in fairly good shape. No real issues aside from some carburetor problems occasionally. There were probably four or five of us in the car. One of my friends had recently read some novel, where a character says, well, Jesus, Buddha, and a bag of chips. Being wise us teenagers, we thought this was hilarious for some reason. We kept coming up with various combinations of blasphemous words in the same vein as the original. After a few minutes of this, all the lights in the car just cut off. Inside and out. Nothing else was affected, just the lights. Then, just as suddenly, they came back on. Obviously, we chalked it up to chance. I had never had that happen to my car before, but it's not something that can be reasonably explained. After a few minutes of nervous laughter, the blasphemy resumed. Again, the light shuts off, and now I was worried. I thought something was really wrong with my car. My friends accused me of turning off the lights. I hadn't, and convinced them of it. Again, the lights came back on. Now, I'm an atheist currently, and at the time was a pretty cynical Christian. I didn't put much faith in the thought that our banter was pissing off God so he was trying to send a message. But still, sometimes you don't tempt faith, right? Well, then you aren't me. Much to the dismay of my friends, I decided to give it one more try. I don't remember the exact phrase, but let's assume it was something that you wouldn't say to your grandmother. No sooner had the last syllable rolled off my tongue, all the lights cut out for good. This time long enough to force me to pull over and turn my car back on. We all sat silently pondering what had just happened. One of my more religious friends said a little prayer in the back seat. I kept my cynical mouth shut this time. Eventually I started the car, and the lights came on as normal. We rode the rest of the way home in silence. I never had a problem with the electrical in the car again after that night. The battery even lasted a couple of more years until I sold it. It was early 1984. My two friends and I went to the Wildwood campgrounds on Long Island with my family. It was a safer time back then, so we thought we'd explore the forest. We went up to the cliffs, looking down at the beach, and back into the woods, soon becoming bored, so we headed deeper in. The woods were dark, tangled, and overgrown with weeds and brambles. It was obvious the area was not used or even explored often, as it was so dense. So we started heading back. We noticed something upon our return, a house in the middle of the forest. Most windows broken with a sagging roof, old and out of place, with no road leading to it, and no power lines either. It had a mailbox at the front, as well as a brick chimney. We entered the small home, of only a few rooms on the ground level, and a gaping hole in the floor, shown an exposed basement below. A rotting wooden table, surrounded by peeling wallpaper, of roses that sat next to the kitchen. There was a collection of old things, and what I identified as a very small, white gas stove, speckled with corrosion. The stairs up and down looked unsafe and rickety. Small animal feces was everywhere, and I don't remember any electrical sockets, lights, or anything of that nature. It must have been from the early 20s or 30s, and the forest had began to grow around it. The whole place was creepy, 
and smelt like egg or a struck match. But what made it really creepy was the hole in the floor. We could only see part of it as the floor bowed and we feared getting too close. We could see on the basement floor that there were hundreds of playing cards, but only red ones, hearts and diamonds. I'd guessed that they were all red. Everything else was really dark. They were poured up in a heaping pile. For why or if anything was underneath them, we will never know. Because it scared us for some reason. The dark hole lit only by that spot making the white and red cards seemed brighter. They were clean. They were new. And we got the hell out of there. I hunt deer in northern Wisconsin with my dad and uncle and family friends. When I was in high school, I acted in the school plays and the weekend of our performances was always the same as opening weekends for deer season. My last performance would be Saturday night, which was opening day, and then my dad and I would wait a few hours and start the five hour drive from southeastern Wisconsin that would go straight to the woods and unpack our stuff at the cabin later. So I slept most of the way up there and woke up because we were driving in the woods and going over a lot of bumps. It was probably 5.30 a.m. at this point, so it's still very dark. And my dad tells me that he thinks we made a wrong turn at some point in the woods. He was going to keep on going along this very poor excuse for a road. More like a trail lots of branches scraping around the truck and thudding as they smacked the sides. I'm looking out the side window when my dad screams, what the hell? I look up and we're face to face with another pickup truck about 30 feet away. Keep in mind that it's basically pitch black. The truck is sitting there with no lights on, only illuminated by our lights. I looked closer and realized there are two really grisly looking guys sitting in the truck staring at us and they look furious. After seeing them, I noticed on the ground between our two trucks was a deer body with no head and the body was completely skinned, but all the meat left intact. My father threw it in reverse and got the hell out of there. He figured out where we were and realized that we were only about a mile away from where we were to hunt. That day we waited until it was just about light out to walk out of our strands. I realized the guys were probably poachers, only killing for the rack and the fur. But just imagine that scene in the pitch black of the woods. I was geocaching once. And as I was wandering through the woods, I came across a small patch of trees that had Mr. Potato Head faces nailed to them. I was a 15 kilometer drive from civilization and nowhere near a trail. As the catch was deep in the woods, I contacted the catch owner and he swore that they weren't there when he put the catch together and it was his private land so nobody should have put them there. The other instance of weird was up when I was hitchhiking and decided to set up camp off in the woods not far from the highway. I had a fire, ate and set up my little tent and fell asleep without problem. I woke up in the middle of the night due to some heavy breathing outside my tent. I listened for a bit scared shitless and then some movement and the sound was gone. I woke up the next morning and there was a photo of my family stuck with a nail to a tree right beside my tent and fresh footprints in the dirt. Being the idiot that I am, I followed the path of the footprints 
a kilometre or so back into the woods, where it ended at a road. Across the street was an abandoned house, and while checking out the house for anything useful, I found several of the photos of people from the photo, individuals, headshots, and notes apologising for not protecting them or being there for them. I got a feeling like I wasn't alone, and decided to make an exit, and as I came out of the house, there was a pickup truck in the road watching me leave. He offered me a ride back to the highway, and some food and drink, and told me all about the family that lived there, and how they had all died. Apparently, the father had an accident whilst driving, and struck an oncoming vehicle, with the mother and two kids inside it. He lived, but everybody else died. My sister worked an hour and a half away from my mother's, where she was staying temporarily at the time, which was bad, because she has a bad habit of falling asleep in cars. So, one night that she was working really late, I made her promise to call me, and I'd stay up to talk to her until she got home. One night, late, I'm on the phone with her, and out of nowhere she starts screaming. She finally gets out some semblance of a sentence, telling me that there was a girl covered in blood, crawling out of a ditch onto the road. She pulls the car back around, and jumps out the car and runs to her, the phone falling to the ground. I am still listening, and I hear the girl start sobbing and telling her, Oh God, not you. I need help. They're coming back. They're going to come back for me. My sister at this point thinks the girl might have some mental issue, because of how frantic and disconnected her thoughts are, and because she keeps saying she needs help. She doesn't seem to think that my sister could help her. Although in hindsight, I think the girl saw a 5 foot 7 hundred pound sister with her high-pitched voice, and thought that they could kill her too. From there, besides screaming and broken glass, I can only tell it from her side. She sees this truck pulling up, and it's about to wave them down, when the girl goes crazy and starts crawling and pleading with my sister to run. The truck puts on its brights, and two very big men jump out of the car, and start walking towards them making clicking, catcalling sounds, and my sister's blood turns cold. She reaches over and grabs the girl, as there's no way in hell she's leaving her, and in a whirlwind, manages to force her into the car, and jump in herself before the men reach it, smashing her lights. She speeds off, clipping one of them, and is followed by this truck trying to run her off the road for about half an hour. They only pull away when she reaches a hospital. Inside, the girl was in a panic, and wouldn't let my sister leave her with the doctors. She kept saying she was her best friend, and repeated her name over and over. From the doctors, my sister learned that this girl was repeatedly raped and then tied up and drugged behind the truck. To add to all the creepiness, once my sister got home, she looked at her name tag, and remembered that she'd left hers at home, and had to borrow an ex-employee's tag, Stephanie. And yet, despite my sister saying she didn't recall ever not fearing for her life enough to get to formalities and exchange names, the girl had called her by her real name. My brother James was part of the orienteering team in high school. For those of you who don't know, orienteering is where they get you to go to the middle of nowhere in teams of two. They give you a map, a compass, and you must find your way back to each check in station, in order. And it's a race. So my brother and his partner set out, and make it through the first few checkpoints, and they're feeling pretty solid. But they don't make it to the next one when they're supposed to. They double check the map, do some math, and figure out that they miscalculated some angle or another, and are now almost off the edge of the map. They recalculate, 
and set off in a new direction. Keep in mind, the line was never intended to be part of the orienteering run. This is unexplored territory. And they came across what my brother said could only be described as a crater. A deep bowl in the forest, devoid of trees. And at the centre was an ambulance. They are in the woods, miles upon miles from any road. And there is an ambulance that looks like it's decades old sitting in a crater. So, being teenage boys, they decide to investigate it. My brother said that the forest was well on its way to reclaiming the vehicle. That it was rusted and covered in plant life. It looked out of date. Like it was coming from the 40s or some bygone era. In the back, the gurney was still there but bent in the middle, like something had smashed it. There were brown smears on the walls that could have been rust, or dirt, or shit or blood. They both got a horrible feeling from the place and took off out of there. My brother thinks he could probably find it again, but flat out refuses to. In the late 90s, I took a day trip over Naples, Florida, with a friend of mine who was interviewing with their fire department and asked me if I would accompany him. We had been travelling down Alligator Alley for several hours when we passed what appeared to be seven dozen white shirts hanging in the cypress trees on the opposite side of the road. Intrigued by this, we made note of their location and on our return trip later that afternoon, made a point to pull over and take a closer look. It was pretty weird. Someone had taken about 30 identical, white pressed dress shirts and hung them at various heights throughout the cypress tree, which was standing in at least four feet of stagnant swamp water. The shirts, were being held up in the trees by some kind of makeshift hanger, composed of sticks, rather giving it a Blair Witch feel. While a few of the shirts had picked up some dirt, it was clear that at some point they had become bleached white, and starched, thoroughly. At one point my friend tossed a rock at it, and it bounced off with a large thud. We stood there looking at this display with the growing sense of unease, Wondering what it meant, and who had taken the trouble to travel out into the middle of nowhere, to wade into several feet of gator-infested water, to hang shirts in trees. In the evening light, it looked even creepier. Between the eeriness factor and the mosquitoes, we decided to return to the car, and drove off, discussing our findings. We decided it was perhaps some kind of memorial to someone killed on the road or perhaps something more sinister, like a ritual of some sort. Through the years, I have read other reports of similar displays being sighted on other remote roadways throughout the country. A few years ago, I happened to be travelling on Alligator Alley again, and did not notice the display. I wish I had been able to get a picture of it. One night. I was solo camping in a remote lake above a small town. You're not allowed to camp near the lake. So I hiked up a little ways onto the hillside and set up underneath a camouflage tarp. It must have been around midnight. I was all snuggled in my hammock when I hear laughing and yelling in the distance. I peek up from behind my tarp to see what looks like a handful of college aged dudes drinking and fishing and having a good time. Okay, whatever. I tried to sleep anyway. I drift in and out for about an hour, but I'm kept from sleeping by an extremely loud bird in the tree next to me that just keeps hooting and screeching. Eventually, I pick up a large branch and thunk, swing it at the tree to shut it up. Suddenly, the dude bros go silent. I can tell that they've frozen, and are looking intently in my direction, 
trying to find the source of the noise. I crawled back into my sleeping bag and tried to sleep. But the bird starts again. I decide I need to find some pine cones or something to throw at it to scare it away. So I get out of my sleeping bag, move outside the tarp, and start looking on the ground. I decide to try the branch again and slam it as hard as I can into the tree trunk and the sound rings out loudly. They all look over to see a pale naked figure hunched over in the tree line, staring at them. I immediately scramble on all fours under my tarp. To them, it must have looked like some horrible pale creature disappeared into the underbrush after having been caught observing them. They go silent, have a muffled, terrified conversation, and pack up and leave. I slept soundly for the rest of the night, but those guys must have been pretty freaked out. I was on my way home from a rather long trip with my mother. We got to a bridge where we saw an elderly woman in a nightgown, Think Grandma Death slash Roberta Sparrow from Donnie Darko. It was fall, so rather cool and the sun was already setting behind the trees. So the white nightgown really shone in the dark. She was just walking. Problem was that she was barefoot and completely clean, like nothing had touched her at all. We had been on this road before the bridge at least 10 miles, and we had another 15 before we got anything that even resembled civilization. It's the road and ample trees for miles and miles around. We stopped and asked her where she was going and if she was with anyone. She kept mumbling to herself, but I remember her eyes. Her eyes were wide, as if she'd seen something frightening. The whites of her eyes were bleached white and the pupils were straight jet black. She never made eye contact with us, and just kept walking forward. We drove off and called the police. We both kept expecting her car, or someone to be at the road ahead, but there was no one at all. Stuff like that doesn't happen at all there, so it was pretty startling to say the least. It was very plausible that it was dementia or something along those lines, but once more, walking on foot so many miles Deep on this road is just unheard of. If anything, that scared us more. I live about 130 miles from home in Aberdeen, Scotland. So I go back to Glasgow semi-regularly. This happened three months ago, and I haven't been home since. It was February night, and I was on my way home to see my family. The drive is unlit on 70 mile per hour roads. So there I was doing 60, and a car just sort of appeared behind me as they do. I didn't think anything of it, so the car starts to get really close. Like, uncomfortably dangerously close. This is in the middle of nowhere, so I'm confused. They could have overtaken me if they wanted to. I started speeding up. I'm doing 75 and a car appears in front of me. They're doing around 60. I start slowing down, but the car behind me is way too close. The car in front of me brakes slowly, down to about 40. I pull out, overtake, and speed up. By this point, my heart is racing, and I'm thinking it's probably racer messing up with me, but this car won't move, and it's about 10 feet behind me. Its lights are filling my car and I can barely see the road. I see a lay-by sign in 50 yards, so I decide to stop to let this maniac pass. I put in the lay-by, last minute, and the car flies by. The car breaks suddenly, almost skidding to a stop. I see it reversing back up the road towards me, and I turn my lights off. The car rolls up slowly next to me. It stops window in line with mine, and I'm just sitting there with my eyes shut. I hear his door open and close. 
This huge figure gets out and slowly bends down to my level and chaps my window. I am about to go into shock. I slowly roll down my window, visibly shaking, and I let out a gasp, asking him what he wants. He replies, I need about three fifty. Then he squashed his car and climbed back into his lock. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. Sorry again for the solo picture in today's video. Clean up post baby shower was extremely challenging. Nevertheless, I hope you still enjoyed. Remember that most of the official Mortis Media merchandise will be disappearing in three days time. So get in there quickly, if there's something that you've been wanting to get for a while. If you would like me to read your story on my channel, feel free to send it to my email, or share it to my reddit, which is of course available in the description. To maximise the chance of your story being read, please make sure to include as much punctuation and description as possible. And don't forget to check out my Instagram and Twitter whilst you're at it. But anyway, for now guys I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.